particularly. So thank you all for having me here. Um, speaking of where I'm from, um, this is it. Uh, this is Mayfield, Kentucky. Um, most of you, well, show of hands, who has ever heard of Mayfield, Kentucky from someone other than me? Like four people, and I believe at least half of you are lying. Um, <laughs> so this is Mayfield. Um, this is the whole thing. Um, so there's our, our courthouse. Um, this little dome up here is the high school. Um, we have a Walmart right there, and somewhere around here is a Waffle House. So we have the basics covered. Um, do y'all have Waffle House in California? S Sonic, get out of here. You don't... <laughs> Bless your heart. All right. So um, this is where I'm from. It's a pretty small place. The whole county is like 10,000 people. Um, so not a lot going on. Middle of nowhere for most, but it was home for me, and it's, it's where I grew up, and it's where I got my start um, with Wireshark. So I want to talk, uh, well, ethereal at the time, but I want to talk a little bit about how I first got started in packet analysis. And my first job out of high school, um, I had this job while I was in college, was I was my school district's, the one I graduated from, their first network administrator. Um, they were paying consultants for a while, um, they kind of knew me from high school, and they're like, hey, you're going to college, you need to be able to pay for it, we need someone to run our network, can you do it? Um, I was definitely underqualified, um, but that didn't stop me uh, at the time. So I started doing this, and we had an issue arise one day where a student had changed their grades. And this was, you know, this is very, you know, cloak and dagger. It was very troublesome. And I think the first thing folks thought was that he had guessed the teacher's password. We know what account it came from. Um, so we talked to the teacher and we, you know, we're like, did the thing you're probably not supposed to do. And we're like, what is your password? And they told us and it was actually a pretty strong, secure password, not anything that was easily guessable. So we know that wasn't what was really going on there. So I got to thinking here, and I got to be really suspicious that the application, it was a client server application that you used to log into this system to manage grades, maybe wasn't as secure as they claimed. And I remember going to my school superintendent and saying, hey, you know, I worry this isn't secure, and maybe someone's intercepting credentials or something like that. And he said, well, Chris, that's impossible. Look at the login page. Username, blank. Password, blank. A login button. And underneath it was a lock symbol. If there's a lock symbol, it has to be secure. <laughs> um, th that's what he said. He said, that means it's certified to be secure. Um, and I said, well, certified by who? Of course, the people who certify things to be secure. Um, we didn't have that back then. We don't really have it now either. Uh, so uh, that was an interesting thing. So what I did is I, I did a little looking around. Um, I hadn't done a ton of packet sniffing at the time. Uh, a little bit of TCP dump here. I dabbled with a little ethereal. And... I said, okay, I think we, we can mess around with this. So I, had, I set up a little controlled experiment, and I had my superintendent log in to his account into this system. Um, while he was doing that, um, with his permission, kind of giving him a hint of what was happening, I did some ARP cache poisoning, um, tricked the, used some ARP, gratuitous ARP packets to trick his system and the router that was upstream um, going up to the network that had the, uh, the backend database. And I basically tricked them to think that I was in between kind of doing like a man-in-the-middle style of attack, and I intercepted the packets, opened it up. Of course, they were in clear text. And so I, I looked around, I highlighted a string of text, flipped my screen around, and said, you know, the big reveal, is this your password? Um, and he got a, uh, his face kind of went ghostly white, and he's like, how did you do that? And I was like, well, you know, it took me five or ten minutes, and... Uh, a skilled student would not be that far behind me. Keep in mind, I was like 18 years, 17, 18 years old at the time, so I was basically the age of many of the students who were around then as well. So that was my first experience with packet capture, and the cool thing about that was I realized that, well, in general, applications and software lies a lot. It makes you think things that aren't always true, and, and maybe they're not all deliberate lies. Maybe they're subtle lies like the lock icon, maybe indicating that the... Uh, that what you're doing, the logging in that you're doing is somehow encrypted when it was indeed not. So I learned a lot about that and I got really interested in the power of a tool like Ethereal or even some of the other packet applications that were out there and started using that to troubleshoot. So it wasn't just a way to, you know, figure out what applications were lying to me and acting insecurely. It became a way to troubleshoot, you know, I'm trying to deploy ghost images to all these machines and why are some of them not joining the multicast stream? Why is this thing running slow at this site but not at this other site? Um, you know, a software vendor or a networking vendor is telling me that something is my fault. Well, maybe it's their fault. How can I prove that? So Wireshark and the tools at the time became a way for me to answer questions that were otherwise unanswerable. And that was an immense amount of power um, to have um, just by having that skill set at the time. 
Now, around that time, I started uh, blogging. As Gerald mentioned, uh, I was blogging. I've always been the sort I like to write about the things I'm doing, um, not just because I like sharing the knowledge, but it also just helps me codify what I know. I learn by teaching, I learn by writing. I'm sure many of you can relate to that. So I wrote a, a blog series called Packet School 101. Um, not a lot of folks were doing that at the time. Um, it got really popular. It ended up on the front page of um, dig.com. Do any of y'all remember dig? Yeah, it was like Reddit before Reddit to some degree. Um, and so it got on there, of course, crashed my web server. It got pretty popular. Um, and a gentleman named Bill Pollock at No Starch Press reached out to me and said, hey, this is really cool. Would you like to write a book about this? Um, and I did. And the first edition, uh, pack, Practical Packet Analysis, came out um, in the mid-2000s. Um, I guess it's been like 12, 13, 14 years ago. Um, and since then, we've released a couple of other versions. Um, I believe um, a bunch of you were given a copy of the third edition if you took one of the classes around here as well. So um, that's been a big part of my career. One of my pride and joys is having written that book and be able to continue to evolve it and write it and so on um, and continue to talk about and teach packet analysis because I think it's an immensely useful skill, uh, particularly as my career evolved and I got into information security. So I kind of moved out of network engineering space. Uh, one of the things I did at the school district, um, are many of you familiar with the, the Snort intrusion detection system? You see a lot of head shaking. So I installed a super early beta version of Snort. And I will tell you this, if you have never installed an intrusion detection system on a public school network that has never had any type of network security monitoring, you, you will see things you cannot unsee, uh, is the best way to put that. Um, and I would later come to find out that I was the first person to install that we know of uh, a network intrusion monitoring solution in the state of Kentucky. Um, on one of those systems, and, and now, of course, they're doing that everywhere. But it was, it was a fun time, and I really got hooked on intrusion detection and incident response, that area of the field. So my career progressed. I ended up working for the Department of Defense for a little while, uh, both for the Army Research Lab and Spay War. Did that for turning into the private sector, worked for firms uh, in Guardians. I worked for Mandiant for a little while. Uh, before leaving, about two and a half years ago, to start my own company, focused exclusively on training and education, mostly online. I'll provide some links to that later on. Uh, that's called Applied uh, Network Defense. Now, my research focuses have evolved a little bit too, and one of the things I really spend most of my time researching now is not necessarily the bits and bytes. We're not gonna talk about detail, we're not gonna look at a ton of packet captures today. Uh, my goal today is to get you to think about some things and maybe some ways you haven't thought about them before, because my research area is really focused in cognitive psychology now, and specifically how we learn and how we teach, for those of you who are teachers in the room, the process of human cognition. Because if you think about the investigation process from a security perspective, investigating something, well even not from a security perspective, even from a general networking perspective, when you investigate something, your goal is to learn about events that have transpired. You're learning about a reality that exists, but you have not been able to perceive. So that's not much different than learning from a book or learning from a presentation or how you're learning as I speak right now. So there's a lot to learn from the science of learning, uh, and this notion of what we call metacognition, which means thinking about thinking, but it sounds a lot cooler to say metacognition. So that's what we're gonna talk about today, and I wanna talk a little bit about the state of information security as it stands now. I know we have a lot of security practitioners here, but uh, the thing I love about this conference is security practitioners are kind of in the minority. There's a lot of other uh, walks of life. So I wanna talk a little bit about security as it stands now. Uh, and I'll also add that um, even if you're not a security practitioner, you are a security practitioner. We're all, all in that and related to that in some degree or another. So uh, the folks at Kansas State University did a great ethnographic study. Ethnography is the study of culture, and so they took poor, uh, two poor souls and placed them in a security operations center for like six months and said, go learn about the culture. And if you've ever been about in a security operations center, that's a tall task. Uh, and they had some really great findings. Uh, the slides will be up later, so you'll, you'll have access to the sources on these things. Uh, so one of the, the things that they said in this study was that an analyst's job is highly dynamic and requires dealing with constantly evolving threats. Doing the job is more art than science, ad hoc on the job training for new analysts is the norm. That's not necessarily a, a good thing. They would go on to say that the profession of security is so nascent that the how-tos have not yet been really fully realized, um, even by the people who have the knowledge. The process required to connect the dots is unclear even to the analyst. That last part again. The process required to connect the dots is unclear even to the analyst. That ain't gonna work, y'all. Even the people who are really good at this job are not good at telling you how they do it. What does that mean when it's time to teach new people how to do the job? 
ain't going to work, right? That, that isn't really a tenable solution. And that kind of defines a lot of the state of information security. It's so nebulous. It's had to grow so fast. So much kind of artificial money has been poured into security that it's been hard to conceptualize the educational side of it. And we see that manifest in a lot of universities that are not really producing job-ready graduates. We see it manifest in a lot of training that honestly just isn't good, actionable training. Um, so it becomes a real problem in how we teach, um, not only to some degree the current generation of network security folks, but the next generation as well. And I think this really puts us in a state of what I would call cognitive crisis. We're not good at thinking about thinking, thinking about how we learn, thinking about how we teach. Now, the thing about cognitive crisis is we're not the first folks to be in this situation. Other fields have gone through this as well. And one I want to talk about briefly um, is medicine. Um, a lot of people think medicine is kind of a nightmare today, and really the bad part about medicine these days is how we pay for it and insurance and all of those things. Medical science has never been in a better place, and we're actually really, really good at training and teaching new physicians um, who are doing really great evidence-based research, but that hasn't always been the case. Um, so there are really what I think three kind of symptoms of cognitive crisis. So if we think about medicine, medicine was here maybe about 100 and 120 years ago. The first symptom is that, and I'll get out of the way so you can read the slide, <laughs> is that demand for expertise greatly outweighs supply. Uh, there weren't enough doctors then. If you lived in a little town like Mayfield, Kentucky, you had, to, uh, you had to go a long way to find a doctor, and when you found a doctor, there were probably also your vet, your undertaker, and the person who delivered the blocks of ice every second Sunday. Right? They were doing a lot of other things, so they just simply didn't have enough practitioners, particularly um, the notion of specialization didn't really exist at the time. It was kind of catch-all to some degree. Uh, most information cannot be trusted or validated. Uh, up until as recently as the 80s, people believed that if you had a stomach ulcer, you should drink milk, and that would make it better. Now, thanks to evidence-based science, we know that that's the last thing you should do. Um, another useful anecdote here, uh, what is the average temperature for a human body? Who knows it? Just yell it out. 98.6, right? That's what you hear is 98.6. That is actually not true. <laughs> um, that is based on a single study that was done, I believe, in the 20s or 30s um, by one gentleman who went around and just took a bunch of people's temperatures. Uh, he was using a device that was about that long. Um, there was a place he was supposed to stick it that he was uncomfortable sticking it, so he did the armpit method, which is tremendously unreliable. Um, and so his data was basically garbage. The truth is the average human body temperature is actually somewhere between like 98.2 and 98.3, but even more truthful than that is that that doesn't matter so much uh, because it's a range and your temperature will fluctuate as much as two degrees in either direction a lot of the time, uh, depending upon a number of factors. Um, we didn't know that then, we know that now, and we know that that is trusted and validated, although it hasn't quite yet permeated uh, kind of popular culture to some degree. Uh, the third is really this inability to mobilize and tackle big systemic issues. Uh, pick your plague of choice, right? That's what we're talking about here. You had all these plagues, you didn't really have a, a, a way to combat or, or stem the tide of those and the infection, and you had thousands upon thousands upon millions of people dying. Now, if you look at all three of these kind of pillars of cognitive crisis, they all definitely apply to cyber security as well as we stand today. So the demand for expertise greatly outweighs supply. Um, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily that we don't have enough people in the field. We do not have enough skilled people in the field, right? And that kind of has this weird trickle-down effect where companies don't hire entry-level people anymore, or, or not enough of them. You won't find nearly as many entry-level jobs because folks are too concerned with the advanced level. They don't have enough people with those advanced skills, uh, whereas they maybe need five or six of them so they can hire a few junior folks. They end up with maybe one or two of them, and they just have to hire mid-level folks. They don't have enough trickle-down um, cap space available, so to speak, to hire junior-level practitioners. In terms of the idea of information being trusted, um, most information in, in cybersecurity exists on blogs, right? And there's a certain beauty to that, the fact that anybody can publish information, um, but also anybody can publish information. Um, and it's not really peer-reviewed, it's not really trusted a lot of the time, it's not really validated by external parties. Even if it's true today, it may not be true um, tomorrow. Um, so it, it's a little easier on the network side of thing, right? Like we have RFCs and we have the IETF and that is really helpful. We have like source documentation. Um, on the host side, it's kind of a nightmare, right? So for instance, we have um, the notion of shim cache. Um, you know this, the Microsoft application compatibility cache. It's a way to prove execution of a, of a file on a Windows host. Um, Microsoft 
it's a feature that they use for like um, caching and things of that nature, but it's not really built as a forensic feature. It was actually written about by Mandiant originally. They dubbed it ShimCache, but if you actually go to Microsoft's website and search for ShimCache, you won't find any results because they call it application compatibility cache, and they don't think of it as a forensic artifact, although it is relied upon by most forensic practitioners in one way or another. So Microsoft doesn't really acknowledge it. They don't provide really good source information about how it works, so you're left to third-party vendors and practitioners and researchers to try to define and figure out how this works. On the host side, we don't really have a lot of really good, trusted, validated information, and that's a problem. Uh, and finally, the inability to mobilize and tackle big systemic issues. Well, all the same problems we faced 20 to 30 years ago, we still kind of face today. Um, things are getting worse before they get better, and we also have the new fancy stuff too, like ransomware, and ransomware is not new. Um, there was a piece of malware called CyberAIDS um, that was released in 1987, and it was a ransomware type tool. Um, of course, the thing that's really made ransomware take off is the notion of cryptocurrency and it being somewhat untraceable, uh, and that really has, has made a boom in that. And that will continue to get worse before it gets better because we just, again, we don't have any way to mobilize and systemically tackle that. We don't have certifi certifying bodies for cybersecurity that are kind of broad and not just industry specific, it creates a real problem and it creates a situation where we, um, again, cannot teach new practitioners to be new practitioners in an effective way and we have all these um, skills that we're lacking kind of across, um, across the board. So, if we're in a state of cognitive crisis, well, I guess the obvious question is what do we do about that? And if medicine was in a cognitive crisis, the good thing about that is we can look at what they did. And this isn't just medicine. Um, a lot of the sciences have gone through this. Physics has gone through this. Uh, law has gone through this. Uh, accounting has gone through this. And that may sound really lame. Like, what do we care about accountants, right? Uh, I just want to make sure my paycheck arrives, you know, when it's supposed to get here. But accounting is one of those things, it's, it's very hard to do. It's kind of investigation focused in a lot of ways. You're investigating imbalances and things of that nature. And colleges are incredibly good at producing accounting graduates who are job ready. They can come out and they can go straight into the workforce and be working very, very quickly without a lot of overhead or on the job training. And that's a pretty admirable thing. And that's something we want to aspire to. So we generally get there through this notion of what I call cognitive revolution. And there are really three pillars to this as well. First, we need to understand the processes we use to draw conclusions. How do we investigate things? Not just what tools do we use. Tools are important, but they're only a, a part of the puzzle. But how do we investigate things? How do we make conclusions? How do we compile evidence? How do we do all those things? We need to write that stuff down. Um, from there, we make those repeatable techniques and methods, and ultimately we build and advocate training and education for that, both in the private sector and in the university sector. And universities have a long way to go here. Um, I generally think this is happening a lot better in the community college level than it is at the four-year degree level in most places, and particularly at the master's level. Um, and those community colleges are probably going to be at the forefront, those who choose to, uh, to jump on it, because they're a little bit more flexible in how they do curriculum and things like that. Um, so that's generally what I see. But I think this is generally what we're, what we're going to have to do, and this is what medicine and so on has done. Um, you know, medicine has medical school now, and that's where they teach doctors how to think. You don't start out on day one doing surgery if you want to be a surgeon, right? That's not how it works. You build up to that. You build that core baseline of knowledge about how to think about all these different things. You simplify things. And speaking of simplifying things, well, there's a way we can do that too. Um, the title of the talk is Mental Models for Network Evidence. And mental models are what we're going to spend kind of the rest of the time talking about to some degree. Uh, a mental model is kind of an abstract concept, but not an over, overly complex one. A mental model is simply a way of seeing the world. It's a way of simplifying the complex. I like to use the analogy of, you know, merging onto the highway. You're going down this slow country road, and then up here is this highway where everyone's going really fast. The mental model is kind of the, uh, the on-ramp that gets you onto the highway, right? It bridges the gap. Humans learn generally through analogy, through connecting old knowledge to new concepts, right? The mental model is a way that helps us do that. And you can also think of a mental model kind of like a set of glasses that you look through. It's not that we have lots of mental models and we change our glasses like every few seconds. Uh, our glasses and the lenses in those glasses are made up kind of of this lattice work of all sorts of mental models that we see through. So let me give you some examples of a mental model. Uh, we have this process here where you have an observation and you ask a question and you generate a hypothesis and you experiment and you produce some type of results. What's this process called? Yeah, this is the scientific method, right? We don't have the scientific method because a bunch of old guys sat in a room one day and said, hey, how should we do science? 
No, they, they looked at how we were already doing scientific discovery. They interviewed people a lot, a lot, talked to a lot of people. They did this whole thing called inductive reasoning, and they built out a model for how this is done. And a lot of scientists these days don't necessarily think in these terms. They just do it, but it's kind of second nature. But the thing is, you learn the scientific method now pretty early on. Like, most people are learning the scientific method in maybe second or third grade. I'm from Kentucky, so I didn't learn it till like, high school. But uh, most of y'all learned it pretty early on, uh, especially here in California, I would imagine. Um, anybody know what this is, what we're looking at here? Yeah, it's the bell curve, right? We're talking normal distribution. This is a mathematical model, but it is also a mental model. Even if you don't understand the math behind it, most of us understand this chart, right? We think about like IQ charts are probably the most common manifestation of this, and we understand the concept that most people fall between one uh, and negative one standard deviation on a bell curve, and then you have outliers at either end. So most people are average IQ, you have extremely low uh, learning disabilities over here, and then you have extremely high IQ, often with social disabilities on that side, right? So we understand how that works, and that's a mathematical model, also a mental model. Those are relatively simple mental models. We have really complex ones, too. Most people, their most complex mental model is the religion they ascribe to, right? It defines our own identity, how we view ourselves, how we view our relationship with other people. Um, and it also brings in this notion of kind of a push and pull amongst mental models. Um, the second most complex mental model most of us will see the world through is our government system. Right? And the way we practice religion does not always jive with the way we uh, act as citizens of a government, right? So your religion may tell you that killing people is amoral, but your government may say, you know, we have to defend X, Y, or Z, therefore you have to go to war and kill people. And what happens at that point is you have this struggle and this compromise that you have to make, and one wins out or the other. So you have mental models that kind of conflict with each other, and of course the ones that are complementary as well. But these things are going on all the time. Now, we also have mental models in professional work, and we'll use medicine as another example here. Uh, medicine is insanely complex, right? really complex. Um, in medicine, you have about 60,000 possible diagnoses, around 4,000 surgical procedures, and 6,000 drugs, and these numbers are growing every day. But medicine has gotten really good at simplifying these so that they can specialize in ways that matter, right? We don't have a lot of necessarily generalists. We have primary care physicians, but they cover kind of a baseline of things, and they're really good at getting people to specialists in a lot of cases. Um, they simplify things through the notion of having 13 organ systems. If you're gonna be a specialist, you really learn one of those systems and how it interacts with the other systems without learning them in depth as well. So you can be a pulmonologist or a cardiologist or something like that. We have the notion of vital signs, uh, pulse, respiration date, temperature, and so on. Uh, those are simple measurements of the body that can be used to indicate something is going wrong or that change is occurring, and you don't actually have to be a doctor to interpret those things. As a matter of fact, nurses are generally much better at collecting that information and summarizing and providing to doctors that changes might be going on. So it's a way to um, allow information sharing between different levels of skill of people. Uh, we even have the 10-point pain scale. If you've been to the doctor recently, you've seen this thing. Um, this is a mental model that allows patients to communicate with physicians in an effective matter, manner. They'll ask you what your pain level is, and you'll say, maybe it's a 6. And they maybe don't care necessarily that it's a 6 right off the bat, but it gives them a baseline. So they can have you take some medicine or, or do a test or wait a couple days and to see if your 6 has gone down to a 3 or if your 6 has gone up to a 9. Uh, it gives them a baseline for comparison, and that's all a mental model. Uh, and that's somewhat... This seems simple and silly, but that 10-point pain scale that's universal and used pretty much everywhere now, super revolutionary thing in medicine because of the things it facilitates, and it's merely a simple mental model for helping us understand the world. Now, we have mental models in information security we use a lot of the time. Um, we have this notion of defense in depth, right? We've all heard about this, the notion that we don't just have antivirus, right? We have antivirus, and we have intrusion detection systems, we have application whitelisting, uh, we lock down our firewalls, we have two-factor authentication, we have different layers of controls, uh, both protective, detective, responsive, and so on, so that if one fails, we have different things going on. Um, so defense in depth is ultimately a mental model. Uh, the notion of an attack timeline is a mental model. There are a lot of different timelines you might subscribe to, this is a Mandiant timeline that describes a typical uh, attack life cycle for structured threat adversaries, so the APT and so on. Um, this only generally describes that. It doesn't describe maybe, maybe commodity malware, but it's helpful to know where this picks up and where other things leave. Uh, there's also a mental model that I think is probably the most, uh, the most used and popular mental model amongst people in this room in network, uh, network administration packet analysis. Anybody care to guess what that might be? 
I heard it over here, I think. Oh, COSI model, right? I think just about everyone in this room um, knows this. Maybe you even know the various acronyms um, that you use to uh, remember it. Uh, I think my personal favorite is please do not throw sausage pizza away um, because I love me some pizza. So uh, this is a mental model we use to think about, um, develop, troubleshoot, and talk about networks, right? Is it a layer three problem? Is it a layer seven problem? Um, of course, some things kind of straddle the, the, the layers these days, and that's kind of evolving, but this is still the baseline most of us work from. So we're going to continue to talk about some more of these that apply to information security, and particularly network evidence. <clears throat> um, to understand this, I think the most baseline uh, mental model we use in the investigative side, so where I live, um, is we generally get some type of input into an investigation. Right, it's an alert, it's a phone call from someone, um, you know, the FBI has found your data on a server somewhere, it's through threat hunting, any number of those things, and an investigation starts. Now the important thing to remember is the investigation is completely timeline centric. And I'm talking security, but this kind of applies to a lot of other general troubleshooting as well. Um, so we have this attack sequence here. And the thing about the attack sequence is, is this is a timeline, and it exists out there kind of in reality. Like it exists, you just don't know what it looks like yet. So the thing is, we have this big cloud of evidence we can push through, and at some point we're going to get inserted into this timeline that we don't yet understand. Are we going to get inserted into the beginning? Probably not. That's not generally how it works. We may get inserted right here. So we have this event, we have this evidence that says something suspicious has gone on, and we have to kind of build out this timeline of events without exactly knowing where we are in the timeline. The way we do that is by asking questions of evidence. We have all this evidence. Rarely is it that we don't have enough data. Usually it's we have too much data. So we ask questions. And by doing so, we may find another piece of evidence that helps us build out this part of the timeline, another one that helps build out the next part. And we go and go and go until we reach what we believe to be the beginning and end of the timeline so that we have a complete picture of the events that transpired. And we can say, did something malicious happen? Yes or no? And if yes, to what degree and who is it affected and how do we need to generally respond to that thing? So this is a mental model that describes, again, the timeline. The notion of the timeline is the core of what we do as investigators, and it's something worth Worth, uh, worth valuing. Now, to build this timeline, I mentioned we have to ask questions. And that is really at the core of my investigative uh, mantra, so to speak. Some of you maybe have like your investigative mantras that you live by. Uh, this one is mine. Um, and it's, it's not my quote, it's Charles Kettering's quote, but it, it's that a question well stated is a problem half solved. Solving a problem or answering a question, so to speak, is pretty easy if you know the tool. If you know that the answer to your question is in network data and you know how to use Wireshark, I'm pretty sure you're going to be able to find the answer assuming you have the right data and maybe it's not encrypted and so on and so forth. So that can be easy once you learn the tool. Asking the right question, much, much, much harder. And if you ask the wrong question, chances are you're probably looking at the wrong data and you're going to miss things. So I want to do a quick exercise with this, with the whole group. Um, so we have uh, a signature here, an intrusion detection signature. This is a, in Snort or Suricata format. You don't really necessarily have to understand the signature format. I've kind of broken it out. But what we really have here is, if you look at the top, it looks like it's home net talking to an external net. So we have something on our protected, trusted network talking out to the internet. Um, it's HTTP, and it contains the user agent, um, python.url. Lib. So URL lib is a Python library. If I write a Python script and use URL lib, I can use it to go grab things from the internet. So to summarize, <coughs> I have a Python script that's run on my network, I don't know what it is, that is downloading something from the internet. Is that malicious? Maybe, I don't know yet. Is it suspicious and worth looking into? Absolutely. So what I want to ask y'all is what question would you ask to investigate this alert? Not what data would you look at, what questions would you ask? What, what would you want to know to be able to investigate an alert like this? Right, throw, throw your hand up if you've got a thought. What's being downloaded? What is being downloaded? Yeah, absolutely. I saw one back here. How many machines or users are doing the download? Yeah, very good. Are you even using Python in your environment? Do you write Python scripts? Does anybody in your network write Python code, right? That would be good to know. How often does it happen to the same machine? Was it a one-time thing? Is it occurring all the time on a schedule? Yeah, absolutely. Anything else? Where is the connection? Where is the connection? Okay. So there's a lot of ways you could go from this, right? Um, I just sat down and wrote a couple of questions down really quickly. 
Um, so where else does the script that made the request do? What else does it do? Right? Can we get a copy of the script? Uh, was it downloaded from the internet? If so, I can probably get a copy from the packets, right? Um, so where did it come from? Uh, what is the IP or host? Is it a legitimate host? Um, do we have a record of it being downloaded? Was it downloaded from the internet? Was it transferred from another host on the network? Is the remote domain legitimate? Um, we had some of these, like was the script ever executed on any other host? Um, and also, does the host have any other alerts pending that could provide some additional context to these things? So these are all really great questions that would help us kind of get to the bottom of this. Uh, and you're gonna probably usually have to ask a lot of them to get to the, uh, to get to the answer depending upon, uh, upon what you're looking at. Now, what you're gonna do when you're doing an investigation, generally speaking, when you have that alert, you're kind of doing this in your head. You may not be thinking through it in the way we've just thought through it here, but you're generally doing what we call a divergent thought process. You're thinking, okay, there's a timeline that exists out there in the real world and I just have to discover what it is. So based upon the evidence I have, there are X, Y, and Z potential timelines that exist. Right? One of them is it's a legitimate user who created a Python script to do something sysadmin-like. Maybe it's something someone downloaded and it's perfectly legitimate, or maybe an attacker's popped the box and they're downloading some type of script to, to do something else malicious. Uh, maybe there's some type of uh, exploit kit type activity going on and it's downloading a second stage of malware. These are all timelines that exist, and these questions will help us reveal the timeline that's gone on here. So that's this process of divergent thought. Now eventually you're gonna have to pick one of these. You're gonna have to pick one to start. Right, so you're going to take this list and whittle it down to one question to answer. That is called convergent thinking, when you narrow down to one thing. So we have this notion of divergent thinking where you create choices and convergent thinking where you narrow down to the one you're going to be doing. And you're doing this kind of subconsciously when you're doing your investigations, whether you're kind of outwardly thinking about it or not. So when we talk about metacognition, understanding our own thought processes, this is one of them that's generally going on here. Um, worth noting, divergent thinking, creating all these choices, more commonly associated with kind of creative thinking and just being creative, uh, creative minded. Convergent thinking is more associated with traditional forms of intelligence, uh, fluid intelligence, things that might be measured by IQ and things of that nature, um, if you subscribe to that sort of, uh, of testing type deal. Um, so just because you're good at one of these doesn't necessarily mean you're good at others, which is one reason team-based investigative work is really useful. And it also means it's really useful to be able to develop these skills. Uh, one of the questions you might be asking yourself right now is, okay, well, what does it mean to ask a good question? What does a good question look like? And I think good questions can generally be broken out into a couple of different forms. Um, so again, we have an attack timeline, we have all these events going on, and we're somewhere in the middle of it, we don't know where quite yet, and we have to ask questions, but we do have one event, and again, that's an IDS alert, it's a phone call, it's something we found while threat hunting, who knows, we have some type of input that is some form of evidence. All the questions we're gonna ask are generally gonna fall into one of three categories, or that we should generally be asking. We wanna know what happened after the event in question, we want to know what happened before the event in question, and we want to know context about the various entities and relationships existing within the investigation. So maybe this event right here is network-based detection. We have an IP address. Uh, we probably have two of them, right? Uh, a local IP, a friendly IP, and a remote IP. Um, so I want to know the friendly IP, you know, what does it do? Is it a server? What types of users log into it? So on. Um, the remote IP, is it hosting a legitimate website? Is it hosting anything? Have I ever seen it before? Questions like that. Is it on any blacklist um, of anything? Uh, and I want to know the nature of the relationships. I have host A talking to host B. What are they talking about? What port are they talking on? What is the protocol? What is the content? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about entities or relationships. So almost every question you ask will be in one of these realms. What happened after? What happened before? And what is the context surrounding that? When you start to think about your questions that way, it kind of simplifies the landscape. This is a mental model for thinking about questions that you're going to ask as you're going about and doing your investigation. Make sense? Now, <clears throat> there's a way you can get better at this. Um, there's an activity, and I want to give you kind of something with this part particularly that you can walk away with. And it's called the question formulation technique. This is something you can do within your own team. Again, you don't have to be security focused. This can be for a lot of things. Uh, I've kind of written it as a security exercise, but you can kind of adapt it to your own needs. So what I want you to do is, uh, we're at, an idea, or we're at a, a network analysis conference, so I start with step zero, I hope that's okay. Uh, we count from zero around here a lot. Um, so step zero, start with some type of investigative input. Um, an IDS alert or an IDS signature is a good choice. There are a lot of these to be found. Um, you know, go look at um, emerging threat signatures, which are free, you can download, you can just pick one at random. Um, or Sigma rules, which are Windows event log based, and you can look at those um, a lot as well. <coughs> so, start with an IDS alert of any type. Um, again, it can be anything. 
And now, step one, ask as many questions as you can. The exercise we kind of just did where I gave you the detection and you go out and you think about all the questions you would ask to answer it, just do that. But the trick is time yourself. I'd say limit it to maybe no more than 10 minutes, maybe as short as five. Um, time yourself. Write them down as you think about them. Don't stop to kind of elaborate on them. Don't discuss them. Don't judge them. Don't try to answer them. Write them down as you get them in order and number them. Um, they have to be in the form of a question, right? Just like Jeopardy, you have to do it in the form of a question or Alex Trebek will get you. Now, step two, label your questions. I want you to think about whether they are open-ended or closed-ended questions because that matters a little bit. So, uh, a closed-ended question is generally one that you can answer with kind of a single word or phrase. It's one thing or another thing or another thing. Um, limited realm of answers. Open-ended is going to be a much longer answer. Right? It's going to be a paragraph or a sentence or just some, something more longer form with a lot more possibilities. Um, specific questions get specific answers. Closed-ended questions are often better if the question is good. If it's a closed-ended question and it's a bad question, you're probably going to miss the thing you're looking for. So consider that. Label whether they are open or closed-ended questions. Consider whether any would benefit from being changed. And finally, we switch from divergent thinking to convergent thinking. Pick your three best questions. If you're on a desert island and you had to investigate this alert to get off of it, what are the three questions you would ask and why are you in this weird contrived situation about investigating things on a desert island? That's probably question number one. So do this, repeat it. This is really good with teams, too. Like, if you have a team of, like, 12 people, like four groups of three or three groups of four, have everyone break out and do it as a team, and then everyone comes together and shares their results. Um, this is something I teach in my investigation theory class. We do this live in class a couple times, and it's a little tricky at first, but once you get good at it, everyone starts sharing their whole conversion and divergent processes. Um, it's a great way to build analysis skills. Um, again, not just security, although this is a security-focused example here as well, and that's called the question formulation technique. Now, uh, we're at a Wireshark conference, so of course I've got to talk a little bit about Wireshark, and I want to talk about a little bit about um, network evidence. <clears throat> um, I think if you ask a lot of people in the room right here, the question I asked earlier is you have some weird event going on on your network, how would you investigate it? I think a lot of people's first answer was, oh, give me the packets, right? Packets or it didn't happen, um, packets don't lie, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's okay, but you really need to, if you're going to use a tool like Wireshark, if you're going to look at network data, you want to do it smartly, right? Like work smarter, not harder. So we think a lot about this concept of pivoting. Um, and this is kind of another mental model, thinking about how we move through networks as we investigate things. Um, we've talked about pivoting, but not a lot of people define it. Well, I'm going to kind of define it for you. Um, pivoting is a process where you search for, through a data source. It can be any data source. You search through that data source, you get results. You take something from those results and use it to search in a different data source, right? So we have a common field connecting two data sources and we move between them like that. So for instance, I'm investigating something and I'm looking at flow data. Maybe it's in the form of firewall logs. Maybe it's the Zeek connection logs. Maybe it's S-flow, J-flow, NetFlow. The, the options are limitless. But I'm looking at flow data and I see something that looks weird. Maybe it's a really large transfer. Maybe it's a port or protocol that I'm concerned with. Who knows? And I take the source IP from that flow data I, found, I found it here, I took the source IP, and I searched for it in packet capture. Right? That is a pivot from flow data to packet capture based upon uh, source IP in this case. Um, a lot of times I want to get more specific, so I'm taking multiple fields. So I might take source IP, dest IP, source port, and dest port to kind of get the conversation that's going on there. Uh, I'm probably going to take a timestamp to limit the timestamp so I'm not pulling back an overwhelming amount of PCAP to look at. But that's a pivot into PCAP. Um, another example, not necessarily a network uh, packet capture related example, is let's say I'm looking at proxy data, um, looking at people browsing the web and I find a suspicious download maybe, someone downloaded an executable that looks a little shady, and I'm asking the question, did they execute it? Well, if I want to prove execution, the best way to do that, kind of the simplest way is to look at Windows Event ID 4688 or Sysmon Event ID 1, uh, which is going to come from my Windows logs. Um, maybe I'm using a proxy that is username aware, so it's tying the username to the, uh, maybe it's authenticating to my Active Directory um, and doing that that way. So I search for my proxy, I find that suspicious file download. There is a username field in that and I take that username field along with the timestamp and search for Windows event logs after that event, again building the timeline and looking for execution of the file. Did it indeed execute? Is there maybe malware on my system? Then start looking at what happened on the system after that. So this is a pivot. And I say that to say this. Wireshark is a fantastic tool. It's my favorite network analysis tool, like many of you. But it pays to really think about how you approach different 
aspects of network analysis and the feature set that you use and the pivots that get you there. So I want to go through a few of my favorite features and talk about how we get there using some of these principles and some of these mental models. Um, I think probably one of the most commonly used features of Wireshark is uh, uh, the conversations and endpoints dialogue, really nice summary statistics um, there. So I got to thinking, well, what are the most common data sources that I go to from or that get me to that page? And I have several of them listed here, uh, and most of them are kind of network-based. Right? If you think about the indicators or the data that exists on this screen, it's, it's mostly the things you find in network data, IP addresses, ports, um, and so on. And I'm pivoting because I want to get the statistics and find out the relationship of those things to other things. Um, so I'm asking questions like, who else did this host talk to? Right? I can kind of get a sense of that by looking at conversations. Um, is this a one-to-one -one or a one-to-many relationship? I can kind of characterize the nature of the traffic based upon one-to-one -one or one host talking to a lot of other ones. Uh, maybe we're talking lateral movement or like some type of worm-based activity, something of that nature. And I can usually characterize at least some of that on this screen. Um, and also just what is the nature of the data? You know, is it just short bursty data like command and control? It's a lot of packets but very little data. Or maybe it's very few packets but a lot of data. It's actually things being transferred into or out of the network. That's what I'm answering here. So that's endpoints and conversations. Another useful screen is, is protocol hierarchy. Um, I like to call this, uh, in the book I call it the lay of the land um, screen, so to speak. Uh, and I generally find myself coming to this from host base evidence. So. Let's say I have a host and it's executed an application and I don't know what it is. It's running maybe that Python script we talked about earlier. Well, one of the things I want to know is, well, what, that, what is that host doing afterwards? And there's a lot of data sources I could take in. Um, operating system event logs and so on like that. Of course, the tricky part you get there is if something potentially malicious is executed on the host, it might be manipulating the logs or doing something of that nature. So I really have to rely on the network even more. Um, so I can go here and say, okay, well, what protocols am I seeing? And what is the distribution of those? Not just what's there, but am I seeing a protocol being used a lot more than it should be based upon what I know about that host on my network? So these are the types of questions I'm asking um, often from protocol hierarchy. Again, we're thinking about not just the tools and what they do, but how we get to them, their role in the investigation, right? Um, I think if you... Um, if there was a way in Wireshark to count what features get used the most, especially by inexperienced folks, I think number one above all else uh, is probably streams. Right? The first thing everyone does when they open Wireshark is right click and follow that stream. Um, even if it's like encrypted or like something they can't read, everybody follows the stream first thing, uh, almost annoyingly. Uh, but uh, uh, following streams, really helpful. And this is good for answering context questions. Right? We talked about your questions are going to be after, before, or about context. Well, in this case, we're often asking, what is the nature of the relationship between these hosts? What data was transferred between them? This is what we're getting here. Maybe we also have event, an event we've already seen or, or known. So in this case, um, let's say we see um, here we have this uh, a file being uh, uh, downloaded here. Uh, we see a get request, and maybe for some reason we think that might be malicious. I don't think this one is. But maybe we think that, or maybe it's a suspicious user agent. We want to know what led us to that point. So it's often easier to view the context of that in the follow stream rather than iterating through each individual packet, as we all know. <clears throat> Probably my single favorite feature in Wireshark is the ability to colorize um, packets. I think I shared that with some of the developers here recently. Um, I think it's the best thing to ever happen um, to Wireshark, um, except for maybe the name change, which was awesome. By the way, a piece of Wireshark trivia that I learned from Gerald when we talked on, our, on, on my podcast a while back, um, I guess when y'all were thinking about renaming the project, a lot of different names came up, and um, the, the animal theme was prevalent. Um, and so one of the, the things that Gerald mentioned was, you know, jokingly that they threw out, like, like, I think it was like packet weasel? Ether weasel, yeah. So, you know, we could all be standing here today at Weasel Fest. Um, <laughs> I, I think they made the right choice. Uh, um, so, packet color coding is super useful, and I think this is particularly useful because this is actually something, whereas most of the things I do in Wireshark, I pivot from another evidence source, this is something I pivot to from other Wireshark features really often. It's really great for elaborating on relationships between packets. Uh, for instance, there was um, a, a Turkish remote, uh, remote access tool called um, uh, CyberEye, and one of the things it would do, it would maintain a persistent connection on the host, and it would just kind of check in like every few hours, but the attacker could like send commands to it, and they would send a command, and you'd see a short burst of traffic, and then the, uh, the infected host would open a new TCP connection out to a secondary host and send a screenshot back, right? Pretty standard activity, but what you could do is you could 
click some packets in that kind of long connection stream that was doing the check-ins. You could color code it one way, and then the big chunks, you could color code it another way, and you could actually see the relationship. Okay, here's a burst, and here's an outbound transfer. Here's another burst, here's an outbound transfer. You could see those relationships really very clearly um, in the PCAP file. So color coding is really useful, and it's something I pivot to mostly from other things in Wireshark, whether it's endpoints, conversations, and protocol hierarchy, um, so on and so forth. Elaborate on the relationships within the nature of the host um, as well. <coughs> Um, the last one, and briefly, I mean, we all kind of know the find or the search feature. Um, really useful if you have some type of input to go on. I mostly use this when I have an IDS alert, and maybe the IDS alert is based upon a string, uh, a string of text or a string of bytes, and I want to basically pinpoint that as a reference point in the packet capture. So I'm using find um, to search for it. It's not always as e easy as uh, searching for evil, um, but sometimes it is. Um, and so you find that, and that gives you the point of reference. You know where you're at in the timeline. You can start looking before and after and building that context of what's going on. So another kind of, I guess, um, simple to use feature, not simple to implement, but simple to use, uh, where we have to think about how we get into that. <clears throat> so um, kind of moving a little beyond that, we're talking evidence here. And, um, you know, one of the things I do, a mental model for evidence, um, you know, network evidence is just a portion of the evidence we have to deal with when we're troubleshooting things or when we're doing security investigation. It's, it's up here. Um, this is kind of a mental model for how I define the, um, the roles of evidence um, that we use. Uh, you know, early in my career, I tried to solve everything using Wireshark. I tried to solve everything using packet analysis. But the truth of the matter is, almost every investigation I do nowadays involves probably at least three to four types of these evidence realms. One of them is network, everything transferred between systems. The other is disk, everything that actually sits on disk, whether it's the file system, the logs, uh, the registry, those things. Uh, friendly and threat intel. Friendly intel is intel about my own host and what their roles and jobs are and their history are. Uh, threat intel is everything about um, unknown entities and what we know about them being malicious and their reputation. And memory, of course, is volatile memory, um, either virtual memory or, or, or stored in RAM or things like that that you're capturing that's kind of transient. Um, Generally speaking, even though we're here, you're probably here because you're really interested in network forensics, and that's good. You want to be good at these. What I generally recommend is everyone needs to be really, really good at one of these. You need to be pretty good at another one, and then you need to be kind of good at at least two more, right? That's kind of a tall order, and I'm not talking about that's what you need to be at day one of your career, but as you progress in your career, that's what you're kind of working towards. Really good at one of them, pretty good at another, decent at the other two. The way that normally works out is somebody is either really good at disk or really good at network. Um, the other one kind of trails a little bit, and then everyone kind of learns a little bit of threat and friendly intel. Memory forensics is kind of new. The tooling is just really evolving. Not a lot of people are really great at that yet. Uh, most companies have maybe like one person who can do that to any type of competency but it's getting better. And, you know, memory's great, particularly for, like, memory-resident malware, and there are some questions you can only answer um, using memory, but there are a lot of questions you can answer faster using other techniques. So think about that as you think about, um, about the evidence you have um, to work with. <clears throat> now, I want to wrap up a little bit with, um, with a little research study we did. Um, you know, and again, I, I mentioned that packet capture data is really important. Network-based analysis is really important. But again, you have to be smart about it. It is not a useful exercise to say, I have an IDS alert. Give me the entire day's worth of PCAP for a single host, and let's try to figure out what happened. That's not an efficient use of processing time. It's not an efficient use of your time. You have to be smart about how you go about it. And so I wanted to study how people approach this. So we did what we called an opening move study. And we have a tool that is basically an investigation simulator. Um, you kind of see that here. We have a Suricata alert. This is for an exploit kit landing page. Um, there's a signature there. Uh, and you see this is from 10.0.0.5 to 8.1.1.1, simplified IP addresses for the purposes of the exercise. <clears throat> so we did a control experiment. And we, with this investigation simulator, you can't see the whole thing here, but it gives you the alert and it gives you a list of data sources. And you have to ask questions, go into these data sources, type in IP addresses, type in file names, and get the evidence. You have to go through and solve um, the investigation. We actually have an updated version of this. It's web-based. I've used it to teach some of my classes. Um, but for now, we use this command line version. And we had this scenario here, and we gave people all these different uh, data sources that you see on the screen. And we did a little analysis. We had a couple control groups. And I want to walk you through what we did there. Um, and we're asking the question, is PCAP always the best place to start? Not just to use. We know it's great to use, but is it the best place to start? So we did a study, and the first thing we measured was what was the opening move people made? 
And given the context of the alert, it contained IP addresses and network data, there are only really three data sources that were really feasible for people to use as their opening move. There were packet capture data, uh, flow data, or open source intelligence information, you know, taking the IP address and plugging it into VirusTotal or Google or something like that. So in group A, 72% of people chose PCAP. Everybody, most everybody chose PCAP, and this was a pretty wide, diverse group of analysts. Um, many were network focused, a lot were disk focused. We had a pretty good sample size in this one. Most chose PCAP. <clears throat> now the interesting thing is we also measured how long it took them to get to the correct answer to solve the investigation and tell me, did something malicious happen and what individual hosts were involved? They had to report various IP addresses and so on. <clears throat> this is the average time it took people to finish. People who started with open source intelligence information, it took them nine minutes. People who started with flow data, it took them 10 minutes. And people who started with packet capture, it took them 16 minutes. So it took them noticeably longer if you started with packet capture data. So then we did another experiment. And we took the exact same scenario, but we removed the packet capture data. And we replaced it with uh, Bro or Zeek data. Are a lot of y'all familiar with Bro or Zeek, right? It's a, it's a tool that processes packets either on, on the wire or, or after the fact and streams them down to a series of files that really mostly gets the headers and maybe a few bytes of content. So it really kind of simplifies things in that regard. So we replaced PCAP with, uh, with the Bro data in this case. So what we have here is less people chose it as their opening move, first of all, maybe because they were not as comfortable with it. Some of them maybe didn't necessarily know what it was at the time, although most reported that they did. So in this case, it went from 72% to 46% of people who are using this data. Um, so here's the chart that's particularly interesting. We did the same study of how long it took them to solve the, uh, the scenario. And here are the results. So you see, flow data and OSINT data were still pretty close to what they were. Uh, but the folks who were using Bro and Zeek, it kind of normalized it, right? It took it down. Um, it didn't necessarily make it the fastest, but it made it online with what everything else was. So what we're really seeing here is, again, the Bro data is just a subset of PCAP data. And this was a scenario where you didn't need a lot of the fancier analysis tools. You didn't need a protocol hierarchy. You didn't need to do color coding. It wasn't quite that complex. You just had to build out a timeline. And so while it will sound obvious, what we found here is that it is generally faster to start with the least amount of data you need to answer the question rather than copious amounts of data and filter your way down. Uh, so I think really the lesson learned here is a lot of people, what you tend to do, especially earlier in your career and as you get comfortable with just a singular data source, is you get an IDS alert or some type of investigative input and you go look at the PCAP. No matter what, first thing every time. I did this when I was starting out too. Um, that is not an effective way to do it and we're kind of able to quantify that to some degree now. The better approach, Take a look at the IDS alert, examine the evidence that it presents to you, what data it's giving you, what is it telling you. An IDS alert isn't an answer unto itself, it is a stimulus for asking questions. So ask the questions, we've talked about good ways to do that, how to get better at that, what some of those questions look like, this notion of convergent and divergent thinking. And then pivot to the PCAP if it makes sense. PCAP is kind of the, uh, the holy grail of network evidence, it is the most contextually detailed piece of evidence, but is not the place you always want to start. If you're pivoting to PCAP, it means you should probably already know what you're trying to answer and a very narrow slice of how to find it. Right? So that's maybe a narrow slice based upon time. Maybe it's based upon criteria. So maybe it's based upon a single host or a couple hosts or a couple ports or a combination thereof. So pivoting from something like flow data to PCAP is really useful. Pivoting from proxy or from Windows event log, something like that to PCAP is really useful. But PCAP is generally not the place you're often starting in a security investigation if you have the other data sources available um, to you. So we use, in the example we use Bro or Zeek, that's just, any, that's just one example. You can really use any other number of tools. I use that one because it's easy and most people understand the log output, but it can really be anything else. So again, my hope for this is that you're taking away, again, we're building timelines, right? That's the core of what we're doing in the investigation process. We're building those timelines and we have a lot of evidence to choose from, more than we can actually go through in the given amount of time. And we have to ask the right question uh, to get through that. Uh, we talked about a lot of mental models for that. The whole notion of a timeline and asking questions is a mental model. Uh, convergent and divergent thinking, that's a mental model. Uh, the QFT for getting better at that, that is a mental model. These are all ways of thinking about the things that we're doing, these mental cognitive processes that we're using to go about investigations, again, whether it's security or something else. So Wireshark's great, I love Wireshark, I love packet capture. Use it, but use it intelligently. It's not enough to know the tool. 
We get fallen into this trap of we just need to learn the tool. We definitely do need to learn the tool. We need to learn the data. We need to learn how protocols work. That's a baseline that we work from. We need to know when to use the tool, how to approach it, how to get into it, how to get out of it really quickly. Our goals are time and efficiency. Anything that attacks either one of those is kind of a denial of service on our, our, our goal and our service to our organization. So. That's all, folks. Um, I'll take a couple questions. I'll just say I'm, I'm a pretty easy person to get a hold of. Uh, my contacts and information is there. Um, I teach um, network security classes for a living these days. I'm one of probably like half a dozen people here who teaches a uh, packet analysis class. It's called Practical Packet Analysis, the same as the book. Um, I also teach uh, investigation-centric classes. These are all online and on-demand at that link right there. Uh, I do them on, on site too, but these are some of mine. There's some more at the link. So if you're interested in some of the stuff I had to say today, um, definitely take a look at that. Read the blog. Most of the things I've talked about today are published free on the blog. Um, some of them exist in these classes in various forms, the investigation simulator, um, and so on. So uh, with that said, I think I have time for a couple of questions, if anybody has them. Sir? Do I have a good open source tool for creating um, timelines? So um, there are things like Plazo, which are good for like automatic creation of timelines based upon Windows event logs themselves. Um, I honestly think it's better to create your own, like manually. So like I, I start out honestly, when I'm doing investigations, I write them in a physical notebook. Um, some people do it in like Notepad or something like that. Uh, and there are some tools that will help you build those. Like once you have it, if you want to plug it into a report or something like that, um, there's a JavaScript library called viz.js which is really good. It's JavaScript library. You can plug, plug it right into the browser with HTML uh, and build like these cool interactive timelines with that very simply. Um, I have a blog post about that somewhere. Like if you search my blog and search timelines, it'll be out there. Sir? CMAP tools? Okay. Any other questions? All right, thanks, y'all.